Hello everyone, welcome to Enjoy the Book of Life. Today we're going to be covering a big topic. We're going to be talking about Christ in the Old Testament. Now when we say this, what do we mean when we say Christ in the Old Testament? Well, we know that he pre-existed his incarnation. And uh, when I was a, a little guy, uh, I thought I was a step up on most people because I knew that Jesus created everything. Uh, very often in Sunday school, who, who created everything? The kid would say, Jesus. And it's like, well, any other God? Yeah, that's right. It was God that created everything. And I was like, wait a minute. That's what John 1 says, that nothing was made without him, right? Uh, so I thought that was pretty good to know that. But then I had this idea that after Jesus created the world, he really didn't do anything mm -hmm. until he showed up at Bethlehem. And so um, as I began to discover that the Old Testament is chock-a-block with the Lord Jesus in various ways. And the three verses that I would bring to mind, and one of them is um, the words of the Lord Jesus on the Emmaus Road, right? Mm. Um, that's uh, Luke 24, 27. I have it at the head of the, of the notes here. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So, of course, the, all the scriptures in those days were the Hebrew scriptures. They weren't, the New Testament hadn't been written. Yeah. And so Jesus unfolded all of these things in the Hebrew scriptures. And we might say, I sure would have loved to have been on that trip. <laughs> but he gave us the Holy Spirit yeah. who inspired these prophets, right? And it's quite remarkable to think of it. Uh, because the second verse that I bring to mind uh, are the words given to John in Revelation 19.10, Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Jesus, the pre-incarnate Lord, the Son of God, was whispering in David's ear as he was writing Psalm 22. Mm. And Peter tells us that these Old Testament prophets, they longed to know what it was they were actually describing. We, on the other end, are able to see these things. Uh, but we shouldn't neglect all of these magnificent uh, portions in the Old Testament that point to Christ. And then the third scripture, which I think is helpful, is what the Lord Jesus said to the Jews of his day. In John chapter, <coughs> excuse me, John chapter 5 and verse 39, he said to them, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But these are they which testify of me. Hmm. So uh, the life is not simply in the wording. Uh, the, the life is in the person who is the truth itself, right? And so uh, we don't want to fall short of entering into the true uh, spirit of prophecy and, and understanding that these words that were written thousands of years ago embody for us glorious truths about the Lord Jesus that uh, we sometimes overlook. So it's a great opportunity to go exploring and to discover more and more about the Lord Jesus. It's a it's a thrilling, a thrilling expedition. Yeah, it's interesting. Each of those verses seems to uh, indicate this idea of, of the spirit of it, of the revelation given. Uh, and, and that this was this isn't something like uh, where you can go and, and where can we shoehorn him in? But he no. here he is. He's been revealed. Uh, it, it's it's this revelation. He was in the, the spirit of it the whole time. No. So so uh, what are some ways that we see Christ through the Old Testament? Well, I'd suggest there are four basic ways. And what's interesting about this is that each of these ways provides its own special benefits. Mm. And I think that's really key to get a hold of that idea. So the four ways that I would suggest are, first of all, in the types and shadows and figures of the Old Testament. Hmm. Now, uh, these three words are used, actually, um, when, when the writer to the Hebrews is describing this, he, he expresses this fact that 
there were um, samples, and that's the word hupodema, the idea of uh, writing above. So if you see a child learning cursive, there'll be a pattern and they'll copy that pattern. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the words that's used, uh, this idea that God gave a pattern beforehand that the Lord Jesus then fulfilled in its fullness later on. So that's one word. The second word is the word skia, a shadow. And the idea of a shadow is uh, there's a real connection there. It shows that something's there or something's coming. And uh, it, it uh, gives certain characteristics, but they tend to be a bit distorted. They're two-dimensional. Uh, there's actually a shadow is the blocking of the light. Mm. But it, it gives it through that method. It gives us an indication as to what we're looking at. No one would ever settle for the shadow of their wife or the right. shadow of their grandchild as a substitute for the real thing. Uh, but shadows are important in the scripture. And then the third word is the most famous of the three, the word tupos, from which we get our word type. And uh, when we think of the word type, the idea is uh, an imprint which could serve as a mold. Now, the first time the word is used in the New Testament is when Andrew says, uh, Thomas says, uh, unless I see the print of the nails. So the idea is he thought he wouldn't have to see the nails because there'd be a one-to-one -one correspondence between the nail and the wound that it left. Um, and so, generally speaking, a type just has one point, like a nail. Mm -hmm. And we get into trouble when we try to stretch that to mean more than what is actually intended. Uh, so, so each of these three, they're related, but they're not the same. They, we, we shouldn't use them as synonymous. Correct, correct. So uh, when we're thinking, for example, about a jigsaw puzzle, uh, there are straight edges. Everybody knows where they go. Yeah. My little three-year-old can figure that out, right? Um, and so we put those in first. And so we have clear statements like that rock was Christ. Yeah. Sometimes we'll find the word anti-type. Uh, Peter uses the word um, when he talks about uh, baptism uh, relative to the baptism of the Lord under the judgment of God and the baptism of the world under the flood. Yeah. And he links these three ideas together and he uses the word anti-tupos. Uh, it doesn't mean the opposite of. It's like seeing two paintings side by side, maybe uh, uh, Pinky and Blue Boy, and we're, we're comparing the one over against the other. So it's not uh, the idea of the opposite of, but uh, over the side, the other. And so we, we look at the type of the tabernacle or the brazen altar, and then we look at Christ and we compare the two. And from this, uh, we use the type to understand the anti-type. So, um, yes, uh, when, when we think of a shadow, for example, this when I walk down a street and there are street lights, uh, sometimes I look actually tall and thin and athletic. And other times I look even shorter and fatter than I am. And, and that's because of the shifting of things, right? Yeah. And so when I'm studying a shadow, for example, the Aaronic Priesthood. Mm. Um, the Aaronic Priesthood uh, is more a shadow, whereas the Melchizedek Priesthood is more a type. So in the Melchizedek Priesthood, there's a very clear definition. God has cropped the photo, so to speak, uh, because Melchizedek was not a Jew. He's not in the genealogy. There's no record of his father and mother, of his birth or his death. And so that's an appropriate uh, picture to put up beside the Lord Jesus, who, as far as his deity, did not have a mother. His humanity did not have a father. He pre-existed his, his birth, and he existed after his death. And so um, by doing that, Melchizedek is really a clear type of the Lord Jesus. Whereas the Aaronic priesthood uh, doesn't exactly fit. Uh, there, there's a hint, something's coming, and there are good indicators, but um, Hebrews is full of explanations as to why the Aaronic priesthood doesn't fit. 
Right. 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 And so we don't want to say that Jesus doesn't fit the the Aaronic priesthood. Right. It's right. the Aaronic priesthood that doesn't fit Jesus. Yeah. So the idea that the priest died and had to be replaced, that they had to keep offering sacrifices over and over, and that they were from the tribe of Levi. And so the priesthood of Christ and our priesthood is based on grace, not based on law. Mm. And so there are quite a number of things that show that actually the Aaronic priesthood was somewhat distorted. And you even have it in some of the, uh, what we would consider types, but they're actually uh, done in such a way, it's a little sleight of hand uh, because they don't exactly fit. So for example, the two goats or the two birds, right? So one bird is taken, its head wrung off, and then the blood of that bird is dipped on the other bird and the other bird is released. And so it would be ideal if the priest could have wrung the head off, there was death, and then somehow got the bird, the head back on, and then let it fly away. Yeah. And that would teach this idea of death, burial, resurrection, right? And likewise, the two goats, where there was this idea of the judgment of God and, and at the same time the banishment of it, right? Yeah. So we, we go to the cross and we see the the finished work of Christ. There's nothing hidden or or um, um, mysterious about that. But what is mysterious is how God actually banished our sin mm -hmm. uh, out of His mind, and uh, uh, from as far as the east is from the west, and the sea of His forgetfulness, and so on. So the, we need the, both the the sacrificial goat and the Azazel, the scapegoat. To understand it fully. So there are these uh, pictures and we, we don't want to emphasize the wrong bits, right? Right. And that's where we have to be careful with shadows. And so with these, you've got, like you said, the straight edges, right. the ones that are explicit in the New Testament mm -hmm. that provide even the, the teaching around it, yeah. uh, a lot through Hebrews and, and like you said in Corinthians there about that rock was Christ or is Christ. Um, and, uh, but then there are those ones that are a little trickier. Um, what, what would be your advice on approaching those? Right, right. So w when you're thinking about a puzzle, uh, the straight edges are obvious, and then we move to the next section, and that is the general pattern. Mm. And so we say, oh, this is a bread barn. Okay, so now we know where these pieces go, right? They're, they're more obvious. But then at the end, We've got sky, and there's no way we can know that particular piece of sky goes in that particular spot, except that there's a shape, and mm -hmm. that shape can only fit in one place, right? So you have the straight edges, obvious, then you have the the clear figures that are are quite distinct, and then you have the sort of the general shape. So if you take the example of that rock was Christ, that's a clear statement. Yeah. Then at the second level, um, we read that um, um, the Lord Jesus said that if you trust me, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. This he spoke concerning the Holy Spirit. So there, we aren't told exactly that the river that flowed from the smitten rock is the Holy Spirit. It's one step removed, yeah. but it yeah. clearly fits into the picture. Then we go one step further and we say, now, uh, is God the Father here, right? We've got Christ and we've got the Holy Spirit. Oh, yeah, sure enough. This is the case where the rod of Moses, its name is changed and it's called the rod of God. Hmm. And so there's the rod of God that smites the rock. There's the rock that's smitten and then there's the river that flows. So the rod... And the, and the rock and the river now, in, th at th in three different levels, one very clear, one an obvious decision. Uh, I mean, the scripture does say that, but it doesn't uh, tie it to that story. Right, right. But then the third one, we can, you know, from Zechariah, you know, the, the idea of God um, smiting his son with the rod, so to speak. So that, I think that would be where we, we have to be careful but we can start at the, we, no one starts in the middle. Right, uh, right. We start with the obvious and clear things, and then slowly we move toward the middle. And so we have these three 
um, three clues. We have the straight edges. In other words, we have the definite statements. Then we have images that fit in, in the picture, and it's great to, to be able to look at the picture on the box to, to get that, right? Yeah. And it's good yeah. to have a general overview of Scripture, and somebody says, oh, this is what this means. I say, no, I don't think, when, when you look at the overall picture, no, that's not, that's not going to fit there, right? right. Uh, just a, a, an example from the New Testament, when the Lord Jesus gives his parables of the kingdom in Matthew 13, and somebody says, oh, well, the leaven, that's the gospel spreading through the world. I mean, on my commentaries, I would have 90% of the commentaries on that passage would say that the leaven is the gospel. But that's totally inconsistent with the picture on the box. Because every other reference to leaven in the Bible is the corrupting influence of sin. And so the idea that in the kingdom, the enemy is at work and he is, he is trying to corrupt what God is doing, that's what Jesus is talking about. The sabotage that the devil is utilizing to try and neutralize the church. But over against that, he says, I'm right on schedule. I'm going to pull this off, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, a, that's an example of someone taking something and saying, this seems to make sense. Um, well, it would if you hadn't seen the picture on the box. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you say, no, this, this doesn't fit. Yeah, yeah. And uh, one of the things is we looked in the People, Places, Things episodes mm -hmm. to trace those through the scriptures and to see, the, well, the fig tree and you follow it all the way through, or this location, Jericho, and to follow it through all the different stories and, and, and to see those themes, and, and that's a kind of a similar, similar aspect. And a lot of these we're seeing, we start in the New Testament where it's clear, and it, there's teaching behind it, and, as we, and, and they're constantly referencing the Old Testament, right. and so we're able to build off of that. But then getting to go in and explore into the Old Testament as well and, and to get an even fuller understanding there. Right, right. Yes, and there are, there are subtleties that we have to watch out for, right? Um, I have a book on modern art, uh, MoMA, the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art. And they have a definition for modern art that says anything can be anything and anything can become anything else. <laughs> a, a type is not simply a similarity. Yeah. It's a purposeful similarity. God designed it to look like that. And that's why he said to Moses, make sure you, you build the temple exactly according to the pattern that I gave you in the mount. Because every detail is going to show up later um, right. re in reference to Christ and his work. Mm-hmm. So we, we've talked about types, shadows, figures, yes. and, and this is one family um, of Christ in the Old Testament. Right. And, you know, we might say there are sort of five categories of types. We're going to be looking at people. Mm -hmm. Adam is a type of Christ. Christ is called the last Adam. And the idea there is that he is the progenitor of a race. And so Adam is the progenitor of the natural race and Christ of the spiritual family. And 1 Corinthians 15 spends a fair bit of time mm -hmm. talking about this, how we born the image of the earthy and we will bear the image of the heavenly. Um, uh, what, one important thing when we're thinking about people as types, and that is to distinguish a type from an example. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Samson, for example, <laughs> he... Uh, he's a bad example in his life, yeah. but he's used as a good type. The judges are all used as a kind of savior, mm. uh, someone who's come to rescue God's people. Uh, he's the only one of the, of the judges, even his own tribe didn't stand with him. In fact, they tried to sell him uh, to the Philistines. And so he's included in the, in the faith chapter, right? Uh, so we will have people in the Old Testament who are good types, but bad examples. Solomon would be one. He's a, a good type of Christ in his kingdom glory, but he's a bad example yeah. in his personal life. He wrote some great books, but didn't get around to reading them. <laughs> uh, we have other people like Moses, who is a good example in yeah. his life. He's, he's the meekest man in all the earth, but he's a bad type. He's a type of the law and what the law could not do. So the law came by Moses, 
he couldn't get them into the promised land. They needed a Joshua, a savior, hmm. to come and deliver them and give them victory, right? And we know this from the New Testament, what the law could not do, but the law brought us to Christ, that, so to speak, Moses brought us to, to our Joshua. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have some that are both bad types and bad examples, like uh, Jeconiah. Uh, we have others who are good types and good examples. Uh, so we shouldn't feel obligated. For example, David is a picture of Christ in his first coming to the world, uh, the, the shepherd willing to give his life for the sheep, rejected by his brethren, lost to the Gentiles for a while, and so on. We shouldn't feel any obligation to try and uh, uh, patch up the bad things David did. Right, right. All right. We, we, we're under no obligation to do that. And let's get back to the idea that they only match in certain ways. If something matches, if the type matches the antitype at every point, it's not a type, it's the antitype. Right, right. it's the same thing. Right, <laughs> right, right. 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 Yeah. So um, anyway, it's, it's important for us to understand that when we're studying these people, uh, and there are lots of them, we've mentioned Melchizedek, we've mentioned Aaron, uh, there are lots of them in Scripture that, that picture for us certain aspects of Christ, uh, and I think it's a, it's a tremendous study. Uh, Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, um, uh, and, you know, uh, Isaac, the, the son of promise, uh, with the bride who loved to her bridegroom unseen, uh, offered uh, at Moriah, um, and so on. There, there are lots of these examples that uh, when we when we read the scripture with eyes for Christ, mm -hmm. we you know Bill McDonald, uh, he understood the criticism. Some people might say Joseph is not a type mm -hmm. because he's never specifically mentioned as a type, but Joseph himself says that the Lord sent me before to be a kind of savior. And he actually rescued the human race and the messianic line by what he did there in Egypt, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you have him with his Gentile bride going from prison to palace. And there are a lot of wonderful things about Joseph. So Bill was very wise when he wrote his book on Joseph he called it, Joseph makes me think of Jesus. So he stopped one step short of calling him a type. Yeah. But I think we're quite justified in thinking of Joseph in that way. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that's one category. Then you have uh, typical things. There are things that are like Christ. You have the pot of manna, mm -hmm. for example. Um, there are there are lots of things that are like the rock, yeah, right? The, the bronze serpent, yeah. right, right. So we have we have things that are that are likened to Christ, and then there are um, uh, events, the creation, right? Mm -hmm. God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. There are uh, lots of these events in Scripture: the crossing of the of the Jordan, crossing of the Red Sea. We come to the New Testament and we see quite clearly these are used as illustrations. We're not saved by blood only, but by water and blood. Mm. Uh, it, it wasn't enough to be saved in Egypt from the wrath of God. They needed to be saved out of Egypt mm -hmm. and their enemies destroyed. So this is used as a double picture when we come into the New Testament. They were baptized in the cloud and in the sea and so on. So, yes, there are, there are a lot of these events. Um, and then there are also, along with that, um, institutions uh, like uh, the priesthood, the judgeship, um, the kingship, and so on. These are institutions, again, that the ultimate prophet, the ultimate priest, the ultimate king, the ultimate judge uh, are all found in the Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. So we'll see little clues and hints that will ultimately draw our attention to, to Christ. Um, and then there are ceremonies. So we have um, um, the Feasts of Jehovah. We have the Jubilee. Um, we have the Cities of Refuge and so on. So there, there are a number of as aspects or directions we can go in, in studying out these, uh, these types. Well, yeah, and I mean, just right there, I mean, if we were to stop just uh, types, well, that, that's, that's a lifetime. Yeah, 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 that's a lot to, to go through. Yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah. And, and it's really good to be consistent 
when we're when we're thinking about the types, right? So people will say gold, that means oh God, the glory of God or something. Well, good. But you better make sure that that's a consistent truth through Scripture, right? Right. Um, uh, like our problem with leaven. Uh, so sometimes people will uh, sort of round off things and say, mm -hmm. well, let's be a little more careful. Uh, sometimes, for example, you'll have uh, Christ as the lion and Christ as the lamb. And say, well, I know what that is. When I read about the lion, that's Jesus. And once I read about the lamb, that's Jesus. Or the pictures of the church, right? The church, yeah, it's a bride. Well, it's a body. It's a building. Right? Well, yes, but it's the church in a particular aspect. Like when we're talking about the church as a bride, we're talking about um, love and loyalty. When we're talking about the church as a building, we're talking about structure, unity, progress. Uh, when we're talking about uh, the Christ as the, bo uh, the, the body of Christ, the church as the body of Christ, we're talking about interdependence and functionality and, and so on, shared life, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not simply saying this is a code when I know what the answer is and I throw right. away, a, right? No, it's, it's in a particular way that this is being revealed to us. And so the same is true with Christ, that when, when he's a king or a prophet or a priest, it's not saying, well, that's just Jesus again. Right. Right. <laughs> right. There's something specifically in mind when that particular picture is given. And to be careful because, you know, the, the Lord Jesus is a lamb, but we're called sheep, uh, but for very different reasons. Right. And so making sure we know. Right. We know Christ the and the devil are both lions. Yeah. That's right. But yeah. for very different reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a, that's a, a real rapid run through um, typology. Yeah. Good. And and the benefit of studying typology is that it takes the abstract ideas of New Testament theology and puts it in 3D. Mm. So it's like taking the white light of the New Testament and shining it through the prism of the old. So it's very difficult when you're reading the story of the cross to distinguish the burnt offering aspect of the cross and the peace offering and the sin and trespass offering aspects because it's all one event. Mm. And so th there are so many uh, complex ideas in the New Testament that are beautifully illustrated in the Old. Just one example, we may have talked about this before, but the garment of the high priest was linen and, and uh, gold mm woven together into one garment. Gold is something that is discovered. Linen is something that grows. It's flax, it grows in the field. And so one pictures his deity and the other his humanity woven into one garment. He was not two people. He no. was one person with two natures. If you pulled those apart, you ruined the garment. Mm. And so the Lord Jesus is, is pictured in this way, the garments of the high priest. When the high priest stepped into the shadow, it would look like it was all linen. When he stepped into the sunshine, ooh, it looked like it was all gold. Yeah. But it never ceased to be what it was, gold and linen woven together in one garment. So when the Lord Jesus is sleeping in the boat, looks like it's all linen, mm. looks all humanity. But then they wake him up, he stands up and he says, Shalom, and every um, water molecule responded to their creator and immediately yeah. grew still. And they said, what manner of man is this? From what country does he come? He's not local. None, none yeah. of us can do that, right? And they recognized his deity yeah. in that moment. Uh, he was as much God sleeping as he was the man standing, commanding the sea. Yeah. But we see the, the two natures woven into one garment. You can't improve on God's pictures. Yeah. It's magnificent. Yeah. I, I like the illustration you gave with the different offerings. The two offerings that are called most holy, surprisingly, are the offering for sin and the meal offering. Hmm. The one that deals with his uh, being accounted as sin at the cross and the other speaking of his humanity. Hmm. These are the two points at which attacks are made regarding Christ's impeccability. And they're hidden away 
in discussing the typology, the Spirit of God says, let me underline this. Yeah. Yeah. Most holy. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Not the burnt offering, which is all for God. Yeah. Not the peace offering, the fellowship offering, but the offering relative to sin and relative to his humanity. Well, hmm. lots to learn. Yeah. Yeah. And again, that it's a big study. Um, now, we are going to talk a little bit about these notes that you're referencing and, and how that can kind of help guide, guide folks through. Yeah. Um, but outside of typology... What are other ways we can discover Christ in the Old Testament? Right. So uh, another area is the Messianic Psalms. Mm. So here we have, uh, and the benefit of studying the Messianic Psalms is that we have, if you will, the inwards of the offering. This is the place where we actually get inside the Lord Jesus, if I can say that reverently, and we can actually hear his thoughts Mm. and his motives and his emotions that we don't get when we see him on the cross. Uh, so um, it's, it's very tender. It's very intimate when we're studying this. And again, he was whispering to David. As David was writing Psalm 22, I'm sure he was wondering, what is this about? They yeah. pierced my hands and my feet and so on. But, but the Lord Jesus, who is the, the spirit of prophecy, mm-hmm. was communicating that uh, to to the, these uh, writers. Now, uh, the thing to watch out for in studying the Messianic Psalms, there are about 16 of them, um, is that sometimes it's the whole psalm, as in Psalm 22. Yeah. Sometimes it's a paragraph. Uh, sometimes it's just a verse. Sometimes it's a phrase. Hmm. And so we need to be careful again that we don't extra- extrapolate beyond the color, beyond the lines, right, right. and get ourselves into trouble. Mm-hmm. There are times when David is writing about himself, about his shame over his sin, right. and then all of a sudden it's, it's the Lord who appears in his sinlessness, and we have to be able to distinguish that carefully. Mm. So... Um, uh, and again, the, we have the edges of the puzzle, um, to help with that. Much yeah. more so here. Uh, apart from one or two Psalms, they're all referenced in the New Testament. Yeah. Um, there are a couple that are clearly messianic that are not actually quoted in the New Testament, but all the others are. Yeah. Yeah. Including Psalm 110, which I believe is the most referenced piece of the Old Testament in in the New Testament. Yes, there are there are two verses there, uh, verse 1 and verse 4. Um, God never gets tired of reminding us his son is the king yeah. and his son is the high priest. Mm. Yeah, priest forever after the order of Melchizedek and son sit here at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So yeah. I wouldn't say God has a favorite chapter, but if he did, that would be it. Yeah. <laughs> well worth the study then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good, good. So we've got uh, types with shadows and figures, like like we first discussed. Then we had the Messianic Psalms, and we just had an episode just a few weeks ago on the Psalms and, and the beautiful things there. And, and we talked a little bit about the chunks, the, the different types, and we briefly talked about the Messianic. So, so this will be helpful, too, zooming in on that. Um, those 16 psalms. And what's remarkable about the Messianic psalms, we would normally think, oh, that's about the cross. It's about everything. Mm. Let me read this to you. Christ, this, the Messianic psalms include Christ's pre-incarnate glory, his incarnation, his earthly ministry, his betrayal, passion, and death, his burial and resurrection, his ascension and enthronement, his return to earth, his defeat of his enemies, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, his millennial reign, and his fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. Hmm. So uh, one thing that's surprising in all of this, we would normally think of the Psalms as kind of um, something that moves us, that's that's a heart, heart ministry. Mm-hmm. But the New Testament writers use it as mind ministry. It's apologetic. Hmm. It's only the Psalms, really, that that give the at least that scripture quotes relative to his burial and resurrection after three days, right? Let, hmm. You will not leave my soul in hell or suffer your holy one to see corruption, quoted by Peter and others in the New Testament to prove 
that this was all prophesied um, in the Old Testament. So uh, again, we don't normally think of going to the Psalms for our apologetics, but the New Testament writers did. Yeah. And mm. books like Romans are full of quotations from the Psalms. Yeah, yeah, very good. Mm -hmm.